this podcast is brought to you by Aldis International, supplying your expert AI and digital transformation staffing needs across the U.S. and Europe. Today, you are listening to our AI in Action series, where leading minds in AI from across the world share their story, success, and advice. AI in Action cuts through the hype and explores the true impact of artificial intelligence in our world today. You're listening to AI in Action. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Ben Cahoon. Ben is the CEO at TechSite. Ben, welcome to the show. Thank you. Ben, let's start with a brief background of yourself and your journey in technology. Could you give us a, a brief overview of where you got started, some of the roles you've held along the way, and, and take us up to the origins behind TechSite? Sure, I'd be glad to. I uh, went to school in computer science and graduated and came out and got really lucky to get a, a, a job at a really good company called Intel. <laughs> so Intel was a, an amazing company to have a first started at a career just because of the, the culture and it was before the tech bubble burst. It was just an amazing um, place to learn you know, how to run an innovative um, company. We were the first software division inside of um, Intel. And so I really got to participate in a lot of growth within Intel in software. That led to them paying for me to go back and get my MBA. So I, I got an MBA. And in the early 2000s, I started running small companies. I initially left tech and went to the automotive industry. It was actually automotive performance. That was a crazy ride, literally. And then I got back into software and have done quite a few different industries. So I've been involved in educational software, IT software. We moved over to Luxembourg and did a, a fintech startup and then came back and and then got introduced to tech. Ben, thank you for that. I appreciate you sharing your journey, especially uh, given you, you started in tech, went outside and you found yourself back here again. So you mentioned you're now at TechSite. So please, from a, a high level view, can you explain who TechSite is as a business? what you guys are, are, are trying to do, and then we can go into the, the data science and AI behind the scenes that's helping you achieve these objectives. So TechSite was initially an idea that was developed out of the University of Utah. Dr. Mohamed Salama was a professor at the University of Utah and a medical director at ARUP, and he had some technology around classifying white blood cells. And so Ralph Yarrow, who's our founder and chairman, saw the technology, brought it out as a tech transfer out of the University of Utah. And Ralph's a, a super successful entrepreneur and, and really VC here in the Utah area. And he hired Rick Smith, who was the president, and Rick and, and Ralph are really the founders of the company. And they started, Rick immediately, similar background to, to me, CSMBA, got started on a prototype. And I came in 2016, bringing investment and additional development resources to take the company forward. At that point, we looked at the market and decided that while blood was super interesting, they were initially going after Lyme disease, that we really needed to find something that would get us to revenue quicker. So we looked at three different markets, one, the human market and also the environmental market and then the, the veterinary market. And it, it has turned out that the veterinary market, because it's unregulated and it's, a, it's actually a massive growing market, tons of uh, private equity money is going there today. That's turned out to be our first really big win. So we, we did a partnership with Zoetis was Pfizer Animal Health. They went public a few years ago and have made a huge effort and commitment to diagnostics. And they started um, buying up reference labs. So they've, they're a, a pharma diagnostics and reference lab company. It's just an amazing partner. They've um, basically white labeled the tech site technology and taken that out um, to the whole world. Uh, the first test was a ova and parasite test, which looks for ova and parasites in dog and cat feces. So pretty exciting stuff. I think you've given some insight into what we're going to touch on in a second and about the various use cases both now and in the future. So obviously, look, the purpose of our series is to cut through the hype behind AI 
and showcase how data, data science, machine learning, it plays a part in, in, in various companies and various industries. So to that point, can you give us some insight into behind the scenes, some of the technology that, that TechSight is using, talk about the data team and, and how all of that is, is helping you uh, drive the business forward? So initially we're going after the veterinary market, but there is uh, the human health market, the human diagnostics market is probably 10 times the size of the veterinary market. So we're basically, from a corporate perspective, using the platform that we've built, which is a SaaS-based, so it's all web-based, deep learning image analysis platform. We've used that. And Dr. Salama, who's still associated with the company, he's now with the Mayo Clinic, but he's still associated with TechSight. And he, early on, had us go towards cells and liquid versus histology. There's some other really good AI companies that are going after histology, which is tissue. And we've really focused to become the best platform in the world for liquid-based microscopy images. So if you look at blood smears, fecal smears, bacteriology smears, pap smears, anything liquid and cellular-based, our platform excels. And basically, there's a few there's a few key parts to what we do. And it starts off with sample prep. So a lot of these sample types are very unique with tissue all of the whole slide scanners today scan tissue really work really well companies like hamamatsu leica uh, 3d histec grundium uh, modic these are whole slide scanner companies you put a slide on a scanner it scans it in it produces a giggle pixel image that gets uploaded to our platform which we then analyze and so we start back at sample prep to make sure that the sample looks good on a digital slide so that it or on a slide so that it could be digitized we've then worked really closely with the scanner companies to be able to scan these difficult to scan types so again tissue super easy liquids are really tough because the scanner needs something to focus on and many times these can be very sparse sample types for example when you do a fecal float only the eggs float to the top. And so you've got these microscopic eggs that the scanner needs to focus on. And that's given us opportunity to create IP around how to actually find those eggs and help the scanner focus on just those. So once we have a good image, then generally those image or images are 300 to up to five to seven gigs. Those images get uploaded to the cloud where we then use an object detection network to, to count and classify these different types of cells, parasites, et cetera, that we're looking at. So it's removing human error and human manual processing and, and automating this with incredible speed and accuracy, which is obviously very beneficial. Can you give us some insight in looking at some of the early adoptions of this technology and, and the impact, whether it's in a particular lab or, or studies where the before and after, after tech sites, uh, product was introduced. I'll start off with the human example and then we'll transfer to a, a veterinary example. So since August of 2019, ARUP, which is a, a big human reference lab located in Utah, they have adopted our technology for a trichrome, fecal, ova, and parasite test. Now, the, the major problem that faces all labs, whether they're environmental, veterinary, or human, is that millennials and the workforce these days are not going into microscopy. They're going into gene genomics and genetics and other things like that where, so there's a gap between the people that they can hire, the techs or the pathologists they can hire and what's needed. And so our technology today really helps fill that gap. So if you look at this project, um, this trichrome project that we did with ARUP, basically what it does is it increases the accuracy and decreases the time it takes to, to do the test. So a technician will still, so we scan in that slide, right? We do the prep, we scan in the slide, it goes to the, we look through every single pixel on that image and we find things like Giardia. So we'll find a Giardia trope or a cyst. We'll present those as little images, two inch by two inch images to the tech. And it used to take a tech about five minutes to do a trichrome read. And that's taken down to 15 seconds. So you can see the huge benefit that is to meet this gap of what's available in terms of people to do this test and the volume that is, is existing in the market. So the other cool thing about that, in addition to decreasing the time that it takes, is that it's just, it helps them be more accurate. 
if you can imagine, if you're looking in a microscope for eight hours a day, looking for these little tiny organisms that look a lot like the other schmoo that's on the slide, it can be, it's very difficult. You've got to be a very highly skilled person and you've got to be over this microscope for eight hours a day. That's rough. It's rough for anyone. So yeah. we basically allow them to look at a nice big, you know, 27 inch monitor. We look through all the pixels and present the potential images for, is this a Giardia or a Entamoeba or whatever parasite we find. We present that to them and they just have to confirm them. Now, the AI is not perfect today. You know, we use hundreds of thousands of images to train. We've got a whole system built out to, to help prove that what we're doing is, is improving and how to choose good models. But then once that's deployed, it, the, the whole goal is to decrease the time it takes and increase the accuracy. We've had instances where uh, when there's a very low parasitic count, there may be only one or two Giardia. We've actually found that the tech site solution has found that presented to the to technician. They then go back to the slide to try to confirm it through a microscopy and they actually couldn't find the Giardia, but they've got a perfect picture of it. So the medical director actually signed that out positive. So it, it does increase accuracy. That whole project resulted in a, a journal of clinical microbiology study that was a peer reviewed journal article that was done jointly with ARUP and TechSight. And, and basically, the, the result was really good results in terms of sensitivity and specificity. We got 98.88% um, sensitivity and 98.1% specific. And then the really cool part of that is they did a limit of detection. So they basically diluted the, the stool and it was five, the, using TechSight, it was five times more um, sensitive than doing um, it, it manually. So again, it has a, a real ROI for the lab because it can decrease the time and incre increase the accuracy for the patients. You are listening to the Aldis Podcast. When you're looking to scale your team or if you are interested in showcasing your company in a future episode, reach out today. Or if you're in the market for a new role, visit our website to view open positions, www.aldis.com. I want to now switch to the team behind it all, because obviously you've been with TechSite now for five and a half years. You oversee all the visions, but can you give us some insight into what the journey has been like for the, the, the data team? So from when it started to, to where it is now with the makeup of data scientists, engineers, obviously there's computer vision, machine learning in there. So can you give us yep. some insight into what it's like behind the scenes? Yeah, sure. So we started off really at a, using what we call a hybrid technique, where we use computer vision techniques along with some deep learning archi architectures that basically did classification. So we would find the objects using uh, a computer vision technique and then classify them using you know deep learning. We 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 still use a little bit of that, but mostly the team has switched over to using an object detection network. And an object detection network is great because it finds, it takes a lot of boxing, but once you've basically boxed and annotated the, the data, then we train it. And again, it's using tens to hundreds of thousands of objects that then produce, produce models. And the benefit of the object detection network is it both boxes and classifies the cells. That's good because we can then use it to classify and to count. So in many of the areas that we're going after, it's important to get a count that either turns into an actual count or a semi-quantitative score. For example, a pap smear, a bacteriology smear, gram stain, gets translated into... There, there's systems that have been developed over many years in the medical markets where it, like a hay Eisen score, where you're translating a count into the probability of, of something being there, either cancer or, in the case of gram stains, just bacteria. So... The, we primarily use a object detection network and, you know, we've integrated with the scanners. You've got the AI that produces the, the results, but one of the things that we didn't realize was going to take so much time and it actually provides a lot of value. It's just the workflow. So there's a lot of workflow that you know, the AI can produce something, but unless that can be integrated into a, a workflow that quickly allows them to confirm the AI then you know, you're really wasting your time. So we've done a lot of work on workflow and then being able to integrate, have an open API that integrates with lab information systems or patient management systems 
at the clinics or lab. In our integration or our project with Zoetis, they actually, you can order the test from the patient management system. It goes through the Zoetis middleware, which creates a test in our system. You scan the test and the results immediately go back to the PIM. So it creates a, a whole workflow for the clinic so that they don't have to manually enter any of these tests. It's all done electronically. Amazing. The, the data, Amazing. Yeah, the data science has been, if you look at the makeup of the teams, We've got some really, some really smart AI engineers that, you know, focus on creating the models. But then if you look at AI, a lot of it's, it's traditional computer science where you're moving files around, being able to creating systems to annotate files, dealing with if you've got multiple experts and, and what if they don't agree and how do you solve those issues when they don't agree. We've also developed tools that, that I haven't seen any other company use that lets us visualize in a 3D space what the AI is coming up with, so how it clusters. And that helps us rapidly create new models. So I can I can say with a lot of confidence that our platform can create models for liquid and cellular-based sample types in microscopy better than anyone else in the world across the, a wide variety of tests. That, that's amazing, Ben. So uh, just to add to that, can you get, give us an idea of how many people are in the team because it, obviously you guys are, are achieving so much in such a short space of time, but how many people are behind the scenes making all this happen? Sure. So up until January of 2020, we were about 30 people in total. And most of those people um, were engineers. The cool thing about that is we were actually profitable um, for the past two years. And since January, we've grown rapidly. So we're at 70 people now. The majority of those people are still in engineering and what we call a data management. The data management team is the team that grooms that data, works with the outside experts. And then the and then we've got another third of that team is on workflow, you know, keep and DevOps, keeping the, the site up and going, being able to create these custom workflows because each test that we do is a little bit different. Right? A fecal test is different than a pap test. It's different than the bacteriology test. So one of the, the secrets to this is making the workflow work well with the AI and then getting it to integrate out with, the, with the, whatever system we need to integrate with. So Ben, as, as you talk about where you're at today with the number of people, the, the various teams, and you've given some insight into the fact that you guys have been profitable, you're successful, and already had rapid growth this year. So when you look ahead for the next 12 months, what sort of growth are you expecting? What are the types of people that you're going to need to hire? When you are hiring, what do you look for? What's important? And how have you gone about building the team to the size it is today? Sure. So most of the tests that we do today are automating existing a fecal, a, a trichrome fecal or a, a fecal float in a veterinary practice. That's the gold standard. And we basically automate and help the technician or the parasitologist or the, the pathologist. We help them do their job. And we're doing that with fecal, blood, pap smears, bacteriology, mold testing. And those are automated existing tests. In the future, there are about 300 tests that happen today in microscopy. So we have literally hundreds of tests to be done using this platform. And, and so we see rapid growth. We're just about to close a, a series E round, which will mean we'll probably double the team again. And the type of people we're looking for are, it's very traditional product managers, test data scientists, and really people who are curious about and, and want to make a difference in, in these medical markets. Most of what we do has been microscopy. But we're actually branching out. We'll talk about that here in a bit. But we're, we're actually branching out from microscopy, things that, that humans read, but just with their eyes and not with, not with the microscope. So over the next little while, we'll go automate a bunch of these existing tests, such as tubercul tuberculosis, malaria, toenail fungus, bone marrow aspirates, circulating tumor cells. There's a lot of, of opportunity. Now, I look at most of those, we'd call them phase one tests when you're automating existing. We, we do see that however, the opportunity to move to what we call phase two tests, where we will actually eliminate the need for a person to, to even look at it. And then even a phase three test would be to take a test like sepsis, where the gold standard today is not looking in a microscope. The gold standard is a PCR test, a DNA test. And that DNA test today is expensive, 
and we could re replace it with an inexpensive AI-based test where basically you do a blood smear and have the AI tell the difference between normal blood and septic blood. And that's different than what we do today. Today, we're, we use a supervised learning approach where we're boxing, training, and creating models. This would be where we just show the model good blood, we show it bad blood, and we let the model um, figure it out um, without actually annotating each cell. Amazing. Final question from me then, Ben. We were speaking before we started the recording about the, the impact of COVID and how you guys have been able to sustain growth, remain profitable, and deal in such a complex space because a lot of what you're talking about is lab-based imaging, which is traditionally been done on site. Can you give us some insight into how TechSoy has pivoted and what the world looks like post-COVID for you and your team? Sure. So when COVID hit, I had previously built an educational software company, 06 to 13, completely on Skype. We, we never had an office. We sold that company. So I knew it could be done, but we found a company. We're actually using their software called GitLab. And GitLab has adopted what they call the remote manifesto, which is they all of their employees have gone remote. They've created a system, uh, a virtual handbook, policies, procedures, values, communication means, all towards a remote environment. And going remote has a ton of advantages for both the team members and, and the company. Obviously, you don't have to commute anymore, right? There's a better uh, work-life balance that can occur. So since January, we've over doubled the size of the team. And because we've adopted this remote manifesto or a, a remote first concept, we've adopted the values, communication protocols, everything aligns so that people can be productive and effective in a remote environment. So even though COVID is on its way out and people are going back to, to normal offices, we are, we've decided to make that commitment. GitLab, GitLab, I think has 1800 people worldwide, all remote. We've made that same commitment. We do have a lab that people will go in intermittently that allows us to do R and D. But from a, from a, from a day-to-day -day perspective, we've, we've adopted a remote first approach. And it just is making immediate impact in terms of the ability to scale, the type of people we can get. We've got people in Luxembourg, Mexico, all of the United States. It just, it provides a, a method for all of us to work productively together and allows us to get the be best people. And they have the, the benefit of working in a, a super high growth environment, but still have a life with their Amazing. Ben, thank you so much for coming on today, talking to us about TechToy. It, it really is a game changer in, in the field you're operating in. And it's great to hear that you're already having so much success. But the exciting part is there's so much more to tackle. So for, for anyone listening who's interested in this space, please keep a good eye on TechToy. Thank you so much, Ben. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's it fun to talk with you and we'll continue our effort to make a dent in, in this medical market. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Oldest Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any Android podcast of choice. You can also head over to our website, www.oldest.com, to listen to more podcasts, view our open roles, and stay up to date with industry news. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more great episodes coming very soon.